Can you see that? OK, Val. Yep, we can now. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Val Innes. I'm SQA's Head of Service for Next Generation Qualifications and Standards, and I want to extend a very warm welcome to everybody in attendance today. Um, I've mentioned it before and I'm going to say it again, I'm sure, at other points in our journey, um, but it is worth repeating that Next Gen HN is a huge team effort. Um, it involves many talented colleagues, each with real expertise in their respective areas, and we think it's really important to take the opportunity to engage with area leads and focus our attention on a single topic. Today's webinar is all about quality assurance and it will be led by Juliet McGinley and Mary Woods. It's the third in a series of six webinars, each exploring specific elements of Next Gen HN and the ways in which we are reshaping our higher national qualifications for the future. We've scheduled one webinar per month between January and June and we'll go on to explore grading models learning for sustainability and reflections on a year of pilot delivery. I know many in attendance today were also present at previous sessions. Thank you very much for coming back. Um, just to let you know that the recording of those webinars are now available on our website. Uh, a final reminder as well for anybody who has joined whilst I was talking and may have missed the intro screen, the webinar is being recorded, um, so we'd appreciate it if you could mute your mics for the duration of the presentation. Uh, Juliet and Mary will finish, I'm sure, with time for questions at the end, but we are using the chat function as well. So please feel free to put any comments or questions that you have in the chat. Um, there are a number of colleagues on SQA on the call today who will do our best to respond accordingly there as well. So with no further to do, I'm going to hand over now to my colleagues, Juliet and Mary. Thanks, Val. Um, I'm hoping Mary will come on screen so everyone can see her. There she is. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming along today. I hope you find today's session useful. Um, we are going to go through an overview of QA, but in the first instance, I hope everyone has signed into menti.com because I want to ask you a wee question up front before we move into the actual presentation itself. So I'm told that if you go into mentor.com and put that code number in, I think Lyle has also put it into the chat and it's up on the top part of the screen. I want you to tell me in a few words how you describe your experience of SQA's current QA approach to HN qualifications. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, two or three minutes, just to um, go ahead and do that for me. How good is that when you see that moving about like that? OK, I'm just going to um, kind of touch base with a few of those comments. Um, time consuming. Um, I like the there's lots of good positive words in there, which is very good um, support to be easy to understand. And obviously, um, familiarity. I appreciate that everyone's familiar with the current process and that puts people at ease. Um, time consuming, I, I will touch on as we walk through. Um, 
fine, OK, variable. I could go on through them all, but thank you very much. I'm, I'm really keen to get a grasp on how people feel about our current HEN before I move into next gen HEN. So I'm going to ask if we can move on to the next. Oh, look, preempted me. So today's um, objective is to cover our higher national quality assurance. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about our current methods of qualification verification, and hopefully you understand the reason for that as we move on. We're then going to touch on extensively the pilot year, um, and you know, those who know me will know I'm completely blatant and honest about where we started, where we've been and where we are now. The evaluation of the pilot year, which is obviously something that we have to do before we move into the bigger um, volume of centres and qualifications that are moving on. We've already started to gather feedback from our e uh, external quality assurance, our EBs. EQAs is the terminology we refer to in next uh, next HN, um, but essentially our EBs. And we've gathered some feedback from our current pilot centres who are under the way. But before I start to talk about our current method of um, qualification verification, I just want to take a wee second and reflect on why HN is where we are. We're obviously looking at a transformation, tra transforming the development of our uh, delivery of our higher level qualifications to support learners. And I think our main aim is to future um, process the types of skills that candidates and students will need as they move into the current workplace in the uh, upcoming years. So with quality assurance, we wanted to ensure that we did exactly the same. We wanted to future proof it. We wanted to make sure that it was developmental and supportive. And although we strive to do that in our current uh, QB activity, we wanted to make sure that we captured all the current, and I'm going to say feedback that we get from centres under a current model and try and embrace that in um, the new model moving forward. Can I have the next slide, please? So under current model of qualification verification activity, we select on our verification groups. As you know, HNCs, HNDs have multiple verification groups that are embedded within them. We select across those verification groups. A centre, if you are a big centre, could have potentially 20 to 30 EBs, in some cases way more than that. So I'm going to preempt people to say we get hundreds, um, but pl uh, plenty of contact from EBs. We ran central verification, we had prior verification, and we had combined assessment support. But during the last two years of COVID-19, which um, came along and swept us all off our feet, we've tried to adopt some of our best practice and tried to introduce new methodology that's helped to support centres through the last two years of uncertainty. So what we have done is we have utilised combined assessment support and the aid to try and reduce assessment burden on centres. Central verification, we have moved away from completely as our graded units have changed in the way we deliver and assess them in some cases. And we've tried to um, trial out group award verification. So as we moved into next gen HN, we've also tried to move our mainstream current QV activity along beside it. Not anywhere near as fast as we're moving next gen HN, but also trying to make sure that the bridge between the two are starting to um, remove. So, as we move forward, can I have the next slide, please? Our current QB activity is very end-loaded, very end-loaded. And that often we find that some of the issues that we receive, we don't find out till the latter end. So that can lead on to reassessment burdens for centres, delays in certification and stress for candidates and centres. So one of the main things that we changed in the quality assurance for the pilot year was we removed the end loaded aspect of qualification verification activity. We moved to quality enhancement, where I know through current QB we have developmental support in there, but the new model for next gen HN moves us into the area where we have upfront engagement with our centres. I'm going to use the terminology touch points, um, and you will hear me say it many, many times throughout the whole um, session, but touch points have been um, what we did right from the very beginning. We have to ensure the validity of our assessment judgments. That has always been our quality assurance criteria is what we measure against. The national standards of our qualifications is what we measure against. However, we have done a radical change over to a new pilot model. And I'm going to be honest, because I always am. We started off with an idea and a theory of how this would be, and we built everything round about that. And we have adapted and aligned as we've moved through the process. The new model allows us to engage with our centres up front 
It allows us to keep that engagement throughout the session and it allows us to enhance our lifelong partnership with our centres through the delivery of these qualifications. However, we don't want to lose what we currently do. There are brilliant aspects of what we currently do in our current QB. So we want to retain that. We want to maintain the mutual respect and trust between our centres, our EBs and our SQA staff. And we want to still continue to engage with our candidates and staff at the centres. So moving away from quality of qualification verification, it's a terminology I'm going to try and have to remove myself from as we talk about next year in the HN. It's almost like trying to remove the terminology of external verifiers. It never happened, but I will move away from qualification verification in HA and next year. We talk about quality assurance and we talk, oh, can we go back a screen? We talk about quality assurance and um, quality enhancement and quality assurance. However, we still will undertake assessment judgments throughout the year. We will contact our centres up front and we will ensure that we engage with them right at the very beginning. Our aim is to ensure that that engagement informs key indicators throughout the year where we can provide relevant support in the assessment design, the delivery and the decision making as and when it happens. So that engagement will begin in the minute you start to um, move on to this qualification. Our, we have also included one EV currently is aligned to the, uh, the qualification uh, quality assurance of each centre for the HN uh, television. However, that may change as we move through depending on the structure of the qualification. We also introduced the role of the deputy lead verifier to be an overseer. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, at the pilot stage, it was open season. We pretty much flung all the resource we had at this to ensure that we captured every aspect of everything that was going on throughout the session. We are two thirds through the year and we are still capturing information and changing documentation before we move into stage A, phase two. Ongoing support of the DLV has been absolutely um, um, overall for myself as, as a SQA it has been absolutely imperative in the process that we've delivered. We have created a new reporting documentation. Everyone will probably get a big sigh at this point. Next, um, quality assurance management system absolutely cannot be the system that we use for this. So I'm afraid we've gone back to a word documentation and that is an interim documentation as we move through the couple of years of the pilot. As you see, this is a pilot, so we have we want the ability of flexibility. It is a full QA pro manual process for quality assurance. I'm not going to lie about that either. And there is a lot of resource intensity attached to it all. However, to reassure you, although we say at the moment there has been unlimited touch points, this, the touch points are structured and dedicated by the centre. You determine when they take place, you determine the structure of the meeting and you determine the attendees. So the centre is involved in the engagement of this all the way through the process. Now can I have the next slide, please? To just give you a visual of the, the support that's in place, we have always got um, the touch points all the way throughout the year, but we have enhancement and support and assessment checks because we still have to measure the, the centres are delivering to meet the national standards of the qualification and they have to make sure that they're meeting the quality assurance criteria. Can we move the next slide on, please? So just to give you an overview of the amount of activity that's taken place, and it is extensive, when Mary comes on to tell you about the feedback from external verifiers, you will get the length and breadth of how extensive this is. Our EVs have been in touch with centres from October, November last year, all the way through, and there are regular touch points on that. We, um, as in uh, Quality Assurance, have been contacting the quality managers of the centres and keeping regular up-to-date contact with them also. We've not just put the EVs who are dealing with the centres into the pot. We have actually brought in all the EVs within those subject areas to ensure that they're kept abreast and up to speed as we move along. And what's brilliant about this is it's also engaged SQA staff with our EVs more regularly as well. We have constant communication and engagement with the EV groups that are involved in um, the um, process of quality assurance. Can I have the next slide, please? So the documentation, um, we have changed the quality assurance report as I referred to earlier on. It's a word documentation. And although we still have prior verification out as a standalone activity, we have put combined assessment and prior verification topics into the QA report. 
because what it does is it allows our EBs to engage with the centres and to start to address some of the questions that may come out of their early engagement about writing of instruments of assessment, how they go about reducing the assessment burden. The touch points are recorded fully within the QA report, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you and say the dynamic and fluid reporting mechanism. We have adapted and aligned the report to meet the requirements of both the individual centres as we've moved through the process. And that's what we wanted, and that's why we built it the way we did. Through the pilot phase, phase one, we wanted to know everything. Mary is a deputy lead verifier who oversees. She's engaged with both the centres and attends every EV activity. Now, we will review all that as we move forward into phase two. However, it has been an absolute um, imperative that uh, Mary has been there. How Mary provides me with a highlight report and the EVs provide her with a highlight report out with the quality assurance report. And what that does is it gives us early indication of any concerns that the centres have, the EVs have, during the delivery and assessment of the qualification. But it also highlights good practice that we intend to share with other centres as well before we move into phase two. So the report is and will probably change as we move forward. However, we want to standardise some of these activities uh, before we move into uh, phase two in August. Can I have the next? So the evaluation we've already started. We were aware we did put a huge amount of resource attached to all this, and we have got lots of information that's already been pulled back. Centres are feeding back to us um, through um, feedback. Our EVs are feeding back to us. So we will look at all that through the evalu evaluation process. We need to look at the NTM process, and we're only two thirds through the year, so we still have a lot of activity and assessment checks taking place. We'll look at the outcome of the quality assurance holistically. But the report itself is not a one-stop report. It's not a step in time. It doesn't look at assessment judgments as in, at that time as the current QB does. It's actually looked at throughout the year. So the quality assurance criteria is embedded within the report and it allows the um, EV and the centre to start to address some of the quality assurance uh, criteria as you work your way through the year. Now, that's also been fed back to us from the centres that that is something that they like and something that they can start to see the build and the progress of the centre the, and the course teams as they move throughout the year. However, moving forward into next session, we do need to structure our touch points. There have been vast amounts through the two centres. It was a small pilot. We did have two centres with one qualification, so it allowed us to do exactly what we wanted to do and put a lot of resource on that. Um, we will determine the contact timelines. At the moment, there have been numerous amounts of those. Obviously, a lot of that, we realise, has been through let's just check, let's just check. Some of that may be that we don't need those particular touch points as we move forward. We hope to, we're working with the, the colleges that have been involved in it at the moment and have developed an internal verification uh, process. And we hope to look at that and work with them to be able to provide a template moving forward into next session for other centres. So I'm going to hand over to Mary now and ask her to provide some of the feedback from herself and the EVs that have been involved in the activity to date. So can we have the next slide, please? Thanks very much, Juliet. Thank you. Um, if I just start off by saying that it's been both a, a privilege and a pleasure to be involved with HN Next Gen. Um, for those of you that may not know, Juliet has already cited that, you know, I, my role was the deputy lead verifier, linking with the senior verifier for television, who was James Wilson, and the EV in that verification group, who was Emma McNear. Uh, and I think from the verification point of view, the, the two verifiers that worked with me were really reassured that, that I had a direct contact with Juliet and her team. And similarly, I had contact with the centres and, and that full 360 degree um, turnaround was involved from our team through to Juliet's team through to centres. So um, it worked really, really well. So as I said, it's a privilege and a pleasure pleasure to talk about it. So if I, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, I'll take the first point on uh, the slide here and refer to flexibility. So basically, um, as you can imagine with uh, HN Next Gen, with any new qualification, flexibility is always built into it. So um, that was our ethos right from the start as a verification team um, to, to really support the centre 
Um, and I really want to flag up here that we talk a lot as verifiers and as appointees with SQA about SQA's values, about being progressive, enabling and trusted. Um, and this was a real example of that being put into practice. You know, we were progressive in that this was a pilot. We were supporting centres with their innovative approaches to really transform the old frameworks into the, the new framework. We were enabling, um, we were supportive, we were understanding. We understood the volume and, and the, the massive task that face centres in terms of delivering an HN framework and at the same time actually developing the assessment structure to it. So it was new and it was innovative. Um, we, we kind of uh, had a very open uh, relationship at the start and, and we were keen to make sure that centres didn't um, leave any stone unturned, that they actually were being brave as well, that they, they didn't feel that they couldn't talk to us about what they wanted to um, do in terms of making radical changes. Um, and the whole concept was about avoiding duplication, um, the, the whole idea of looking at the integration and the holistic assessment approaches. We were trusted in our cooperative working, in our shared practice, um, between the, the verification team and the centres. There was no ambiguity right from the start. There was a clear decision-making platform in, in the uh, touchpoint meetings that we organised. And in terms of establishing working relationships, um, there had to be that mutual trust and respect right from the start. There was an openness. There was an informality to the process because that's what HN Next Gen, uh, you know, kind of demands, in my opinion. It's not a formal a, you know, approach. It's much, much more informal. Um, it still follows very closely the, the compliance levels of the QV criteria, but it's supportive, it's reassuring, um, it's proactive. And I think the EV team really were very careful about the questioning to elicit, um, you know, what was going on with the, the process and the structure within the centres. Um, but I also would say that, you know, um, centres themselves had a, a really good positive approach to it all. They had a can-do attitude, even although they were facing a mountain of work in terms of the new developments that that imposed in them as they're running with their, their programme delivery. So lots of pressure there. Um, but there was a transparency in the whole process between um, the v EV team and the centres. There was a balanced and progressive approach and really want to flag this up in terms of the establishing of the working relationships, that there was no hidden agenda by anyone, any party involved. There was real, that real transparency. In terms of regular contact, we just started to feel that it was appropriate for our team uh, and our pilot to, to organise monthly meetings. That's what worked for us. That's not to say that that needs to be done in the future. There was that built-in flexibility. So, for example, just now, when they're at the height of their um, assessing assessments, we have, um, you know, negated a monthly meeting in the, in the, the month of March and we're moving to April. So there's that built-in flexibility to be adaptable. We did a lot of the meetings by virtual MS Teams. Um, we have had a one face-to-face -face visit with the centres and we've got a named centre contact, a lead person, if you like, for the HN teams in both centres. And of course, um, meeting face-to-face -face and actually getting into centres, we've been able to talk to students and get their feedback. So that's been really positive. In terms of better understanding of development, I think most of you will appreciate that if you're developing a new HN framework, you know, that developmental process is a continuous ongoing process. Um, and we found staff were not afraid to discuss the assessment approaches and the decisions being taken. There was that joined up thinking between the teams. There was that mutual respect, respect and trust. Um, it wasn't easy, I'm not going to lie. You know, we didn't hide um, the, from the daunting issues that, that, that we were jointly facing. Um, and where support was needed, we gave that, for example, in how to assess the meta skills, how to break down component parts of the projects, um, and, and primarily how to reduce the assessment workload from the different framework, from using the different framework. In terms of the larger projects um, and replicating industry expectations, for me, this was you know, a, go a gold nugget. Many of the project ideas were already tried and tested exemplar pieces that might have been used in, old, in the old framework, but they were refreshed to meet the requirements of the new framework. And there was real discussion between the verification team and centre staff, practitioners, about the job roles, 
being more specific in the monitoring and the reviewing process really captured the industry standards and the expectations in terms of meta skills. There was a real focus in relation to the grading model criteria of um, the uh, you know sort of distinction in the merit and uh, the achieved status and how that that was to become realistic to industry expectations. So gathering the evidence over time throughout the programme delivery delivery in terms of the project tasks and the assessment tasks in terms of technical expertise and center, uh, sector expertise, as well as obviously academic progress. So in terms of the new reporting structure, Juliet has already spoken about that quite a bit. Um, and I, I particularly like the, the QV reporting structure for HN Next Gen. It's, it basically adopts the QV criteria. It allows centres to see where um, we, we can um, comment on the criteria from 2.1 to 4.9. We can um, complete it in real time, if you like. And if there's any areas where we're not able to kind of say that it's compliant, then we can actually refer to it and say we need that kind of evidence in order to be compliant in that specific um, criterion or ca category. But I think what makes it really special is that there's been additionality put into this new reporting structure and it's right for HN Next Gen because it includes a whole section on the pre-delivery support and uh, all of the support that we, we've uh, provided for a centre. Um, it provides QA and support criteria, as I've said, but it also includes the actions required for compliance. It includes a section on the meta skills and the grading models, and most importantly, that support and guidance, that process that's being undertaken. Um, Juliet spoke as well about the reporting structure that I have to her and that the EV team had with me. Um, and that really has been comprehensive and it's worked because after a touch point meeting that might have only been an hour, um, we have actually um, you know, summarise that content of that meeting while well, it's fresh in our, our minds. We have made the action points that inform the monitoring activities that we were doing, as well as um, the reporting structure of the HN Next Gen um, report. Uh, and in terms of the last uh, bullet point here, in terms of contribution of the EV and the QD provided, um, in terms of continuity and understanding of the qualification standards, I think I would just sum that up with one word. It has been immense. And Juliet's talked about that, you know, the fact that it's been kind of 24-7, we've taken that on board and it, we've been on tap effectively 24-7. Um, but I want to allay any fears there that that was our choice in this particular pilot to kind of be available and, and to make sure that that mutual respect and trust was there. Uh, and Juliet will be proud of me because right at the start with the verifiers I said you know this isn't an open house to be filling out huge expense forms here we all kept it curtailed and I think like most EVs you know they do they go above and beyond so we went above and beyond but that's not to say the SQA were charged for that there is a recognition um, that this needs to be modified going forward and that we would have structured scheduled touch point meetings that had an agenda and actually focused on outputs um, there was a lot of emails and touch point meetings, uh, monthly meetings. There was um, QA meetings. Um, it was very effective and functional, and it reflected the commitment of the whole team and, in fact, the centre staff. So if you could move to the next slide, please. OK, so last but not least, the things to consider for phase two. Well, I most definitely would say to you that the DLV role is crucial to it because that's that's the balance for even a senior verifier who'd been in the qualification de design team as James was. He was really, really happy that I was able to, with not being a subject specialist, be able to kind of refer to those quality assurance aspects that they needed guidance on. So I think that's crucial. Um, also think that the internal verification structure, although that was happening within the centres, uh, we were a wee bit not as in close contact with that as we should have been. So I think that that would need to be an area where we actually have upfront and um, clear guidelines as to how that's operating. Because in essence, the internal verification structure really supports the external verification structure. And if we know that that has been done, then, you know, um, it, it's, it's a really holistic process there. Um, in terms of more defined touch points, Juliet's touched on that. Um, we would um, ask for agreed contributors. Uh, in our particular pilot model, we really only saw the named contact and in many cases, some 
some candidates within the centre. So I think we would want up front the agreed contributors and, and how that contact was going to uh, work out in terms of the, the, the scheduled um, touchpoint meetings. The defined inputs and outputs I've spoken about, that's really important. And last but not least, meta skills tracking in the matrix. I have to say in that last bullet point that centres came up with fantastic meta skills tracking matrices. Um, it was excellent. The meta skills was tracked not only in subject specific um, assessments, but across the programme delivery. So uh, I'll end on that high note, Juliet. Thanks, Mary. Can we move on to the next slide? I think you will see from um, Mary's um, contribution there, the EVs have gone above and beyond. I think it's everyone was really keen and excited about this um, qualification next gen, and I think everyone was uh, keen to get involved in it. We're already starting, I know there's some comments in chats in the chat box, we've already started to engage with our EVs for the qualifications in the, the new phase and we will start to engage with our centres over the next few miles. Can I ask for the next slide please? So we asked um, a couple of centres and I know they're probably on this call today, so thank you for providing that with us. What we've done is we've summarised some of those points that you've raised with us. The rest of the feedback that came from our centres will be part of the evaluation um, activity that will be completed by June, end of June. So I think one of the things that we want to highlight is to our centres um, is not to underestimate the, the, the resource that is required up front. You know, comments like staff had to unlearn previous approaches. We asked for this to be dynamic. We asked for this to be moving away from the norm. We asked for it to be ambitious. And the centres have certainly risen to that in the pilot phase so far. And I think that's exactly what we were looking for. And I think centres were actually very, very keen to do that. And some of the centres um, were already starting to make those moves on their own without even the introduction of next, uh, next gen HM. They advised a radical shift in thinking when it came to assessment. You know, we talk about combined assessment and the things that we have done to try and reduce the assessment burden, but the next gen HN qualifications are doing that in the structure of the qualifications themselves. It requires setting up new systems, writing assessment matrix, because one of the biggest fears and one of the early indicators way, way, way back was how do we ensure with the bigger units and the bigger um, activities in the project, how do we ensure when a candidate leaves how do we ensure that they actually get attainment for the achievement that they've undertaken? So a lot of that was put into the writing assessment matrix ensuring that we could easily record where candidates had achieved. I think one of the other big advantages was working with the TVQD team. So the, the, the actual qualification team and the development of the qualification moving forward, having the centres involved in that was actually one of the, the most um, amazing things because it allowed that upfront learning and engagement. Can I move to the next slide, please? So this is a feedback I absolutely loved. A reduction in the assessment burden by 50%. I think even two thirds way through the pilot, I think that says in itself, that's an absolute success from our perspective and probably very much so from the centres. The move to um, driving on project-led assessment and aligning to real work practice, I think is exactly what we've been looking for under these qualifications um, uh, right from the beginning. As we said at the very beginning of it, that we were looking to future the types of skills that candidates need in the workplace. Project-led real work practice is a high indicator of that. I think the, the interesting part as the meta skills was introduced into this was it gave a fuller picture. And I think we understood that as well. But I think the meta skills initially were a scary thing and moving into the structure of the qualifications and everyone was a little bit apprehensive about it. But now I think meta skills are actually one of the things that people love about these qualifications as well. The feedback here from the centre was that it gives student collaboration and you get to access the types of skills that the candidates are achieving, like compromise, tact, engagement, giving contribution into the projects and team working skills because we are the day long projects. So there's a lot of skill sets that are coming out of that and embedded within the meta skills, but also engagement is that the meta skills are starting to move up the levels. So you're starting off at lower levels and starting to gain as we move across. QA touch points have been invaluable. 
Um, I think that is absolutely 100% true, not only from a centre's perspective, but also for us and the waiting towards practical assessments. So the feedback from our EVs and the feedback from our centres on two thirds of the way through the pilot has been exactly what we were looking for. And we're really pleased with that. However, as I say, we're only two thirds of the way through. We still have to move through the rest of the year. And once we get to that, we will do a full evaluation of every aspect of the quality assurance model. I don't expect to have radical changes. We still want the, the main emphasis on support development and upfront engagement. However, um, we will start to tweak some of the touch points and putting objectives, etc., like I mentioned earlier on. So, whistle stop tour. I think I'm actually on time. <coughs> Starting to lose my voice now. There you go. But I think I'm actually on time. So, Val, if you want to stop the recording, we can open up the floor to questions. It's grand. Thank you very much.